Uh, but let's uh, give a round of applause for Juan and Emma. Man, it's it's always it's always such a such an encouragement when I see uh, them two just be up here and like a family worship God because that's what we do here in the desert, right? Not only are we family, but we worship together. Uh, and it's always such a pleasure to even see Aaron uh, be up here and even Ted and Lacey. Did they do such a great job for the welcome and the contro? Man, I don't know, but when I saw Ted and Lacey come at the pre-meeting with their sweaters, I'm like, man, they look really presidential. Uh, it's like a, it's like a it's just power couple, just in, in my face a little bit. I'm like, man, Lacey, we got to step it up a little bit. Uh, but anyways, I, I just want to say how amazing it is to, uh, to be with you guys this afternoon. You know, I, I think the, the sermons before, the lessons before uh, Christmas uh, can always be a, a, a t- type, type of uh, intimidating time. I don't know why I slurred my words like that, but it's okay. You know, because I know we have an amazing Christmas service on the 19th, uh, and we're going to meet together the day after Christmas. So I'm like, man, I don't want to take all the good topics for Christmas, right? But uh, our, our time today is titled, Seeing is Believing. Seeing is Believing. And raise your hand if you've ever seen the movie Polar Express. I, I need to see everyone's hand raised because Polar Express, I feel like, is like an American staple, right? Uh, the weird animation. I don't know if when you saw Santa, I'm like, whoa, this is, he, he, he looks a little funny. But it, it was a beautiful film when I was a kid. Right, and so I have a, a small clip to maybe get your minds uh, where I think the Spirit is going to lead us uh, this afternoon. Watch your step, watch your step. You can't be walking up here. It's mighty slick, mighty slick, I tell you. Oh, what? There you go. What did I tell you? What did I tell you? Years ago, on my first Christmas Eve run, I was up on the roof making my rounds, but I slipped on the ice myself. I reached out for a hand iron, but it broke off. I slid and fell, and yet, I did not fall off this train. Someone saved you? Or something. An angel? Maybe. Wait, wait! Well, what did he look like? Did you see him? No, sir. But sometimes seeing is believing. And sometimes the most real things in the world are the things we can't see. Wow. Yeah. Man, Tom Hanks was, uh, was throwing some knowledge. I remember I, I, I saw this film and I'm like, man, Woody's a train conductor? That's crazy. Right? <laughs> Woody's a train conductor, but I love this, I love this film and, uh, because it's really a journey about a boy trying to figure out if Santa is real, right? Uh, and they go through this uh, insane journey, uh, but I want to pinpoint what he said uh, at the end of that little clip. He said, sometimes the most real things in the world are the things we can't see, uh, the things we can't see. And growing up, I was like the main kid throughout the movie uh, during Christmas, during the holidays. I have this one story, and I, and I shared this with the Sweeney's uh, during, uh, and Mikhail during lunch when we were talking about, you know, one of our f- funniest Christmas memories. And when I was around 12, I, it was kind of the trend in school to persuade each other that Santa's not real. Right, and, and that, was, that was kind of the thing. And I remember uh, my mom told me, hey, Roy, it's time to write your letter to Santa. It's, it's due. I need to go to the mail and, and send in your letter. And I was like, Mom, I am not sending a letter this year. And I'm like, and my mom's like, you do it every year, Roy. And I'm like, no, 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 it's not the year I'm a grown-up. Uh, and, and my sister obviously is a year younger than I am, and she's like all with her letters, super excited, gave it to my mom. And then I just remember the back of my head, I'm like, Roy, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta be cool. You gotta be cool. Don't, don't write a letter this year. He's not real. Uh, and then we went to San Francisco maybe for about six days, and a couple of days we arrived. It was the 23rd, I believe, so, or it was the day after Christmas, so it was the 26th. 
and I was waiting for my presents, but I remember I didn't write to Santa. And my sister has this pile of presents, like, right next to the tree, and I'm looking around, and I'm like, where are my gifts? And then I look behind the tree, and behind the tree was this small little bag. And I open it. It was like this velvet red bag with a big gold S on it. And I look inside, and it was one big piece of coal. <laughs> and then in, and in the tag, it said, should have wrote that letter this year, Roy. <laughs> and, it, and it said, I'll see you next year. Love, Santa. And I'm like, man, I should have wrote my letter. It said, I believe in you. Please come down with the, like, Give me that post-Christmas special and just come down with my gifts, please. Uh, so I, I don't know if that was, I, I remember, you know, I, I look back at that memory and I think, man, if that was Santa, that would have been crazy. If it was my mom, that was just an elaborate prank uh, to, to teach me a lesson. But, you know, I, I even struggled with believing what I couldn't see. And my friends kept persuading me, I've never seen Santa, I've never smelled Santa, I, I think I saw my dad eat the cookies one night. Santa's not real, right? And so, but, but I remember even growing up during the holidays, I struggled with believing what I couldn't see. But I think in the same issue bled into the way I even managed my faith spiritually, right? I think the problem is, I think even me, we sometimes choose to not have faith. And we stumble with our faith from time to time. But only when faith seems like the most convenient solution, that's when we start desiring faith, right? When things are not going our way, we turn to other solutions, but then, you know, things hit the fan, and we wonder why our faith is not working. And sometimes we blame God, or we blame the people around us. Why isn't our faith where it needs to be? But God calls us to have faith. Right? How much faith does God call us to have? How much faith? A mustard seed of faith. And I, I think when I read that scripture, I find it amusing how God only wishes for us to only pour a small amount of faith. Because it kind of almost feels like that's the, that's the only way that we're capable of doing it, right? It's almost kind of a diss by God, but I, I just think that's just God being gracious. That we need to have a small mustard seed of faith, but our tendency is to turn to other answers or come up with other solutions that, that's, that's more attractive than our faith, that's more attractive than giving uh, and surrendering to God. But when those solutions fail us or don't sustain us, we wonder where our faith goes. And so this shows me that losing faith isn't a natural process. It's not a normal thing, if that makes sense, but faith or losing faith is a purposeful choice. We, we make the intention, we make the decision to lose faith. Does that make sense? Does that, is that catching a little bit? And so we're going to talk about faith this afternoon. And, and so just to bring it back to, the, to Christmas, you know, the Christmas story is a story of faith. We know that the focal point of this story is baby Jesus, right? Looking just great in the manger, uh, looking pure, right? And the MVP, the most valuable person, player, is Mary, right? Giving birth in a manger. It's not comfortable. She's traveling miles upon miles. She probably got bunions on her feet or whatever, right? But when you're pregnant, it's not fun. I can't relate. But raise your hand if you think pregnant is an easy time. No, no it is not. James like, that. ugh, right? <laughs> It's not, right? So you think about it. She, she is the MVP of this whole entire story. She is the GOAT, like we say, greatest of all time, right? But I tend to, and maybe others, overlook a few characters involved in the story, and I think about characters like Joseph and the three wise men. You know, we don't really pay attention to Joseph. We don't really pay attention to the three wise men. But, you know, although the story isn't about them, and it's not, it's not about them, I would like to think that their involvement in the story has a potential opportunity for a hidden lesson from God. When we read their story, you know, if God is a God of Acts 17, I believe that he crafted a time and a place 
for the not-so-important characters in the Christmas story. Amen. So we're going to shed some light on Joseph and the three men. Uh, and, you know, rereading the story reminds me of the truth that the Word of God is living and active, isn't it? The Word of God is living and active. Like, remember the time where you would reread this part, a particular scripture or the same scripture, and, and it just means or just meant differently, like, every time you read it. Do you guys have a scripture in mind? Right? Raise your hand if you guys have a scripture in mind where you would read it time and time again, and it just hits new, right? I'm sure the Bible has uh, an insane amount of scriptures that, that, that have that same impact on me. But how incredible is, is it that the Word of God stays relevant, right? That it never gets old. And I think good stories should always be like that. Raise your hand if you remember the first time you watched your favorite movie. Raise your hand if you have a favorite movie. All right, in the count of th- think about your favorite movie. And in the count of three, I just want you guys to shout out your favorite movie. All right? Three, two, one. Wow. I heard Home Alone, and then I didn't hear any other (laughs) other movie. But I'm sure there was a lot of great movies, right? But you think about, man, why is that your favorite movie? It's probably because you connect with the character or you love the storyline. And I I loved Home Alone, too, because, man, Macaulay Culkin just ate those two guys up, man. Like, that's such a good movie, right? But I want you guys to remember... Uh, the first time you watched it, and then maybe, I don't know how long it could be, but the second, third, fourth time you watched it, right? You watched your favorite movie. It feels like maybe at different points as you rewatched it, you caught things that you didn't really see before, right? Or you caught details, certain details out that made this movie even more your favorite movie, right? And so I think about that all the time when I I read stories like this in the Bible is because God has that same impact. And I believe he does this with his word because he always works to reestablish a relationship with you. He wants to spice it up. He wants to make it new, make it relevant. And I think the Christmas story for me this year gave me that same understanding. You know, I believe I caught something that has given me a great perspective especially when we talk about Joseph and the three wise men. And I want to share that with you guys this afternoon. Because I believe it's a great uh, start to a year when we talk about faith. But if that's the case, then isn't it awesome that at the end of the year, it's good to talk about faith? This topic of faith is so important. And I think it's, it, it's a topic that we don't talk a lot about. And it's, it's true. And so I want to present to you a couple of case studies, which is Joseph and the Three Wise Men, and I pray that our time together can help reignite your walk with God uh, and give you a useful way to be faithful this holiday season. Amen? Amen. So, Joseph and the Three Wise Men, we're going to talk about Joseph, right? Have you ever felt like you were dealt a bad hand in life? Have you ever felt that? Have you ever felt that, that you were dealt a bad hand? I hope you guys probably know what that may feel like. But maybe you had this version of what your life wanted to look like, or maybe an instance in your life you wanted, you had expectations, but it didn't pan out the way that you wanted, right? What were some of the emotions that you felt during that time? Probably sadness, probably disappointment, probably utter frustration, right? Or what were your attitudes towards God even, right? What were, how, how were some of your prayers sounding like? Was it out of complaining or disbelief? God, why are you doing this to me? But I think Joseph in this story felt like he was dealt a bad hand. So we're going to read in Matthew uh, 1, verse 18 to 21. If you have your Bibles turned there, if you want, you can turn to the screen. But man, when it's the Word of God, sometimes we just got to feel it, see it, right? Because we can do that, right, with the Word of God. So it says, this is how the birth of Jesus the Messiah came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. Amen. So imagine this, right? Joseph, a man ready to get married to Mary, finds out that Mary is pregnant and it's not his. Oh. 
right? I think this is a solid start to a soap opera, if you, if you don't mind me saying. I'm sure there wasn't like Jerry Springer or Maury at the time saying, you were not the father, or something like that, right? Billy Jean probably was inspired by this story, right? The kid is not my son, if you guys know that song, right? But how would you feel if you were Joseph facing this dilemma, right? You were given this, this issue, this, this problem, this obstacle. What would be some of the thoughts or feelings that are racing through your mind? Would you have made the same decision to stay with Mary like he did? I think many probably would have walked away. But we see here Joseph stayed, and what helped him was a dream where angels reassured Joseph, and so I wanted to talk about the journey. And so we all know, man, Joseph was given this, uh, this problem, this obstacle that, man, Mary, my wife, is pregnant, and I'm not the dad, and I don't really know what this would look like, but an angel is telling me to stay. Okay, like, that, that's a pretty big issue. But the story doesn't stop there, and I think there's this, uh, there's this crazy journey that they go to. And as I was reading, okay, what did that journey look like? I wanted to really connect with maybe how difficult Joseph and Mary's um, travels were. But if you guys know from, Na uh, from Nazareth to Bethlehem by foot, it was a four to seven day journey. And we all know what desert nights can feel like sometimes, and maybe we all love it, but there are some days where it can get a little cold. Uh, and research says that around that time in that region, the desert or the Judean desert would be as cold as 30 degrees at night. And we don't have, they didn't have Columbia jackets, they didn't have the best, they didn't have Burlington Coat Factory, right? So they were freezing in that 30 degree weather, right? And, and even a lot of archaeologists even think that there were dangerous animals like lions, bears, um, and crazy terrains like, uh, like high tree forests. And even people uh, or, or, or archaeologists that even found signs during that time say, t warning people to beware and not walk uh, this path. And that's where Joseph and Mary walked down to travel to Bethlehem. And they even found enemies. And, or they didn't find enemies, but there were historical accounts of pirates, bandits, robbers, thieves uh, that were in that path uh, and, and really preying on different victims. Uh, and that's where Joseph and Mary walked how crazy it is. But the most crazy part about this whole story is Joseph had to deal with a really pregnant wife, right? And Joseph, just, Joseph was walking this donkey, and, and, and Mary was obviously on this donkey, and I can't imagine, right? But we, we all know when, when your wife who's pregnant really needs something, you better make it happen. So, so Joseph was being a good husband and making it happen, right? Uh, so th this, is, this is the problem. This is, a, this is what they were going going through. And even when they arrived, right, we all know the story, the, all the inns were overcrowded, they overbooked their Airbnbs, there was no reservations, right? And, you know, it, and they gave birth at a stable surrounded by messy animals. And so this is just not the picture. <laughs> this is not uh, what Joseph and Mary probably imagined. So he was going through it. He probably could not believe the events that took place. You know, how in the world can he see any good that's happening in his life right now, right? And so I think really the story of Joseph and trying to put myself in Joseph's shoes uh, helps me to, to see what faith looks like. And faith is, and we're going to talk about this couple things as we talk about Joseph, but faith is doing the unthinkable and faith is acting on the unpopular. So what do I mean by that, right? Faith is doing the unthinkable, right? Faith is being willing to do the unthinkable despite not knowing, Right? For us, sometimes trials come about, and we can get scared, we can be intimidated, we can be frightened, and probably Joseph felt a lot of these emotions. But rather than facing them, we want to ignore them. We want to brush it under the rug, and it's not out of a surrender for God, but it's out of a surrender to our fear. Right? Life gets difficult. New responsibilities come alive, and I think it can be a terrifying thing knowing we have to face these hardships that come with these responsibilities, right? Imagine the tension that you may feel, the stress, the many nights of worries. Maybe you broke down into tears and that led to pleading in your prayers with God. 
we have faced these emotions, and I think these holidays can bring that out of me, right? Finances and buying gifts, having to conquer the large crowds in the malls to make sure you get the right gift, right? Planning family events and the pressures that can come from that. Maybe the health of our loved ones, thinking about the holidays and wondering, am I going to spend time with my family this year? And there's a lot of things that we can feel. And I think my tendency with some of these issues is I don't face them head on out of confidence, but I can be frightened. And I can question myself. And I can even question God's power. You know, Joseph knew that he had to endure. And although he was very decisive that he wanted to leave, he decided to still make it happen because he accepted he could do it. And he accepted the promise of who his son was going to be, right? But it's the unthinkable, doing the unthinkable. And lastly, faith is doing or is acting on the unpopular. Because if you think about it, right, it was not his child. Uh, and back in the day when the old, divorce was almost considered a sin, you could not even divorce your wife unless they were unfaithful. So in this case, Joseph had the opportunity to divorce Mary, and it would have been okay. And they lived in a small town, and so everyone must be chit-chatting, maybe labeling Mary, labeling Joseph. They would probably be walking down the marketplace, and they would get a lot of fingers pointed at them. And so probably Joseph felt a lot of shame, a lot of guilt, and this pressure, oh man, I don't, I don't think people are really, are really vibing with me staying with Mary. But Joseph could have listened to all those people, and he chose to hear the promise that God gave him about the birth of his son. But I think Joseph's victory is that he had this narrative set for him, right? But God gave him a chance to change, and he took it, because Joseph could have easily been a deadbeat dad, right? And he could have abandoned Mary. Uh, Mary could have done it on her own, but Joseph stayed, and he had this narrative. And I think Satan tends to undo all that God has destined for you. And I think Satan, re really what he wants to do is he wants to change your story to something that God doesn't intend. Our faith helps rewrite what our sin can create. What narrative is your faith creating for you? Do you hear God trying to change your narrative through instilling faith in your heart? You know, Joseph couldn't see what God had in store for him, but after being reassured, he believed that God was doing something. And I think through believing, Joseph started to see what he needed to do. So when we are unable to see exactly where God has us right now, believe like Joseph. Choose to endure like Joseph. Surrender to the plans of God. You know, 2 Corinthians 5, 7, it says, For we live by faith and not by what? Sight, for we live by faith and not by sight. And this is true. And Joseph teaches us to endure and to obey. Because when we do, our faith can really usher in some of the most remarkable things that God can do through you. And through you, he can impact the world. Amen? Amen. So the next people I want to focus on is the three wise men. And so we all know this story, right? Matthew 2, 9, 12. It says, then Herod called the Magi uh, secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, go and search carefully for the child as soon as you find him. Report to me so that I too may go and worship him. After they had heard the king, they went on their way and the star they had seen when it rose went ahead of them until it stopped over a place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with the gifts of gold, frankincense and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. And so I want to break down some more info on these three wise men, or the magi, right? Because uh, there's unbelievable nuggets that can... Uh, help us piece this greater story that God wanted to tell through the people he incorporated in this, in this story. And so who were the three wise men? And so we have Balthazar of Arabia, Melchior of Persia, and Gaspar of India. 
And so these countries are from the Far East, right? And if you think about these countries at that time, it's crazy to know that these were some of the biggest nations in this era, right? And so knowing their background, if they're from the East, many biblical scholars could agree that their upbringing and education allowed them to have an excellent knowledge of astrology, which was highly regarded. And so they studied the stars, and they know the importance of the cosmos. And so when they saw the star, they immediately recognized a prophecy of the coming of the king of the Jews. And when they saw that, they were like, oh, we've been waiting for this. And so imagine the excitement that these three guys, they're probably like hyping each other up, like, oh, it's time, it's time. Like, we're going to go, right? And so they see the star, and they're, they're ready to follow it. They notice the magnificence of it. And as they reach their destination, these men who symbolize education, class, regality, see a Nazarene boy born in a stable with parents who come from lowly origins. And so their faith was well noticed in their reaction in seeing Jesus because in the scripture it said, when they saw the child, they bowed down and worshiped him. And oftentimes we can have these moments where we're face-to-face with Jesus, but it's challenging for us to bow down and to worship him. And so many times throughout Jesus' life, he called so many to just be present and acknowledge him. And so you think about in the New Testament, stories like Martha and Mary. Martha had a hard time being in the presence of Jesus. Simon Peter, right? Remember that question Jesus asked him, who do you say I am, right? You're the Messiah. Who, who do you really say I am? Who do you say I am, right? Jesus asked the disciples this question because I think people had a hard time really connecting who they were with. And you think about doubting Thomas when, he, when Jesus resurrected and Thomas could not believe face-to-face with Jesus that he was real. Thomas thought, you're a ghost, <laughs> right? Like, people had a hard time. But how easy it is for us to doubt the same way. You know, I vividly remember when I left the church. And I would cry myself to sleep because I didn't want to hold on to any type of faith. I was like, God, I am done with you. And I shared you guys a story, but I remember God, and it felt like he was talking to me or maybe communicating my dreams because when I would be in bed, I, I remember God or this, this voice in my head saying, okay. If you want to play it your way, we'll play it your way. If you don't want to see me and my work, I will work around with the people around you. And I was like, man, I don't even know what that means. But, you know, until I opened my eyes to see how God just pushed me on the sidelines so I can witness his work. You know, my friends at the time were, a lot of them were really stumbling in their faith. And it just kind of felt like back to back they recommitted. They moved to places where there was community or they moved to churches where they can get a lot of accountability and I just watched their faith grow. A lot of them even went into the ministry. You know, my family, despite going through a divorce, uh, my parents still decided to be faithful, right? My mother throughout that experience would just pray courageously and I would watch her weep in the living room just praying for God and his will to be made known. And I just, hearing those prayers, I was like, oh my gosh, like how in the world can you do that? And the teen ministry that I left, they continued to move along and it just kind of felt like maybe I was this weight because when I left that club, like they baptized like three or four teens uh, uh, when I I left uh, and, and went to college. Uh, And some of those were kingdom kids or people that they met through our TBT club. Um, But as much as I aimed to force God out, he continued to call and bring people to him. And there's a power in God. And that's all he wanted to do. That's all he wanted from me. All he wanted from me was to acknowledge him, was to see his work, to see his power. And the three wise men did exactly that. They saw and they recognized Jesus. And when they saw this baby and recognized the power behind who this child was going to be, they prostrated themselves. They bowed down because they believe that the prophecy has came true. 
that the Messiah was here. And after they worshipped him, they offered Jesus gifts, like we read in the scripture. And this is the part where I'm just in awe of God's intentionality when it comes to crafting stories like this. And I totally believe God's hand was throughout this entire process, even in the gifts that uh, Jesus was being given. And if you think about it, gold, at that time it was a, obviously it's, it's a really valuable mineral. <laughs> it's a very valuable uh, thing, and it, it, it symbolized kingship, um, royalty, frankincense. Uh, it was used to... Uh, to signify righteousness and holiness. When things would be sacrificed, they would sprinkle frankincense on it. It was a popular and a very valuable incense, right? And myrrh, it was an embalming oil. So in uh, bur burial practices, right, they would uh, use myrrh to spray on the dead bodies because it was, uh, it was part of a, a ritual, and so when I think about these gifts, I think these are so random to give to a baby, right? <laughs> you know, like, what is a baby going to do with frankincense? What is a baby do with embalming oil, right? And so, but I think about it, and I think these kings knew what was happening and knew who this baby was going to be. And when I did some research on these three gifts, it all symbolized and connected with the authority of Jesus, because gold, right, it's kingship. They recognize that Jesus is king. The king of the Jews is here. Let me give him a gift that symbolized his authority. Frankincense, it was righteousness and holiness. Jesus is king who is the son of God. Holy, righteous is he, right? And myrrh, Jesus is king who is the son of God who, die, who died and was buried for our sins. And so there's this connection with even the life of Jesus, and it was represented through these gifts. And I love that because I think these three wise men knew who they were giving these gifts to, and that was Emmanuel, right? The angel who told Joseph his name is going to be Jesus because he will die and save for the sins of many. Amen? And so the three wise men symbolize to me a faith that is devoted to the amazing truth that is Jesus Christ. They understood what Jesus was to become, and they decided to disobey Herod, the one who sent them, and, and kept it a secret. And I think sometimes in my faith, I labor too much, or I get too worked up on trying to do something, always applying my faith into some sort of action and making sure I look good and I'm, I am good and I'm doing good, right? But whether it's maybe reading a new book that helps my quiet times, maybe it's, okay, probably I need to be reading more in my words, so let me add 30 more minutes into my quiet times. Maybe it's praying more because somebody told me to. I think rather than doing all that, what my faith needs is just to be in the presence of Jesus, and just to be in awe. I don't remember the last time I was in the presence of Jesus and I felt this awe. Like, whoa, I do not deserve to be here right now. And I think we need that. You know, I bear my gifts to Jesus by my love, my time, my devotion because I recognize his power. I recognize his magnificence. So what gifts this Christmas you, can you give that recognizes the way Jesus means to you? So looking at these characters that often get overlooked, I hope if there's one thing to walk away with is that God celebrates remarkable and genuine faith. Amen? And my takeaway for you guys is Hebrews 11.1. 1. Now faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. And so there's these two words, right? Confidence and assurance and Assurance, another way to think about that word is the word commitment. And so we need confidence and we need to be committed, right? And in Hebrews 10, 19 to 22 is the last passage we're going to look at and we're going to take this thing to a landing. It said, therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way open for us through the curtain that is his body. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with the full assurance that faith brings, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience 
and having our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold unswervingly to the what? To the hope we profess. For he who promised is faithful. And I'm going to leave this passage up for communion, and, and, and I want this passage to really help our hearts connect um, with what communion is all about. But to me, really, the Christmas story gives way for the birth of the one who we hope for. And this passage talks about how we need to hold on to the one we hope for, which is Jesus. Amen? And to have confidence in what his sacrifice on the cross meant, that we commit ourselves to Jesus, who promised and is faithful of that promise. And so in the holidays, we, we celebrate Jesus because he came to forgive and rescue us from our sins. And the forgiveness of our sins, the freedom in our bondage, and the one who made a way for a relationship was our Jesus. Amen. And we worship him this holiday. We, we are thankful and are grateful for the love that is in Christ Jesus. So Brothers and sisters, I hope this afternoon, and even to help prepare for the holidays, I challenge you guys and pray for me and pray for one another that we can have this faith to live by how we believe and not by what we see and how we see. Amen? Because seeing is believing. Let's go ahead and pray um, for a communion and let's reflect on the bread and the juice. Heavenly Father God, Lord, thank you so much. Um, for being uh, the God that you are. God, from the beginning of Genesis to the end of Revelations, God, you, you have handcrafted your word to tell a story of your great love. God, we do not deserve your love. We do not deserve this grace. But God, it's a love that you so lavishly pour on us, uh, although we are undeserving. God, I pray that this holiday, as we... Uh, get our hearts prepared to connect with uh, what the birth of your son, Jesus, uh, means for us. God, I pray that we can be connected uh, to this faith that we need. So grateful for the ways that you use people, unlikely heroes, God, to, to tell your story in a greater way. God, I am appreciative of Joseph's faith to just do and to act even when it was unlikely it was unthinkable. I'm so grateful, God, for the three wise men. God, that they, don't, they didn't even connect with the history of, G, uh, of your son. God, they, but they believed. And when they saw, they recognized and they worshiped him because he was deserving of that. Lord, I pray that we can be disciples uh, that can simplify what it means to have faith. God, to know that you are always here through the challenges in our lives, that you will rescue us from the obstacles in our lives. And through the example of your son, God, you can rescue us, you can form us, you can transform us, God, and you can do remarkable things with the lives that we are given. Lord, I pray for this communion. Thank you for the sacrifice that your son has made on the cross. Help us to connect and be present and recognize how loving, how amazing, how powerful your son Jesus is. We love you. Pray for everything in mighty son's name. Amen.